Hello, I'm Neil Ferguson, the Millbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and Chair of the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, regular visitors to this site will know that we like applied history, uh, and that means that we especially liked uh, the talk we just heard from Heidi Torek, Associate Professor at the University of uh, British Columbia, uh, graduate of Cambridge University, PhD from Harvard, and the author of News from Germany, The Competition to Control World Communications, 1900 to 1945, which came out last year with Harvard University Press. Heidi is somebody who works on the history of communications, I think it's uh, fair to say. And uh, for me, uh, her book and the talk that she just gave to our working group uh, has really helped me uh, to understand the structure of the global public sphere uh, in the mid 20th century in ways that I've found illuminating as I come to think about the global public sphere in our very different age. Uh, so Heidi, let me begin by just asking you to talk a bit about the news agencies uh, and the transition from a world of, of telegraphs and telegrams to a world of, of wireless telegraphy, uh, because these seem to me to be the key themes or at least the structure uh, that underpins your book. Yeah, thanks. So um, we all actually know what news agencies are. We've seen them all the time, but we just tend not to think about them. So uh, most of us have seen news from Reuters or Associated Press. And my book looks not just at those two, which uh, Reuters at least began in the mid 19th century, but at the German equivalent. So what are news agencies? A really simple way to think about them is as news wholesalers. They station correspondents around the world, collect news and then supply it to newspapers which then will choose which parts of the news agency's news to print. Um, the key here is that news agencies are actually really intertwined with communications technology. So they emerge when submarine telegraphy emerges in the mid 19th century, because they want to take advantage of this new technology to station correspondents around the world and then send news uh, back to be printed in newspapers. Um, there are three major news agencies, a British one, uh, Reuters, French one, Agence Savas, and a German one, Wolfsteigrafsches Büro that emerge in the mid 19th century. They create a cartel so they can make it cheaper to collect and distribute news. And this cartel functions quite well. It's really though the transition in the 1890s that I talk about in the book, when German elites start to think that this is a system that's disadvantageous to Germany, that they need to try and find ways to break beyond this cartel and also beyond the technology that underpins it, which is telegraphy. So German elites start to invest in wireless telegraphy and also in other news agencies to bypass this system and send news from Germany around the world to try and bolster German geopolitical and economic ambitions. And Heidi, you show that the Germans were right to be worried uh, because with the outbreak of World War I, almost uh, the first thing that the Royal Navy did was to cut uh, Germany's telegraphic uh, communications to the rest of the world, uh, which uh, which revealed one of the huge vulnerabilities that that Germany had in a in a system of globalization that Britain really dominated. Britain owned, as it were, the the Victorian internet in the form of uh, global telegraph uh, wires. Talk a little bit about how the Germans responded to that and how far they were successful uh, in using their alternative. Uh, infrastructure of, of wireless uh, uh, telegraphy and gi giant uh, uh, telegraph poles, uh, or rather wireless poles around the world to get their message across. C conventionally, we think of German propaganda and German information as having been drowned out pretty effectively in World War One by uh, its British counterpart, but you argue that it wasn't quite as simple as that. It was not. So one of the things that we see is that that moment at the beginning of World War One, when the Royal Navy cut so many submarine cables, is not a surprise to much of the German military. In fact, it's something that they had anticipated in their war planning uh, for quite some years before when from the 1890s onwards, they came to believe that communications infrastructure actually was part of warfare. And it's part of why people like Admiral Tirpitz and others were pushing for the development of wireless infrastructure because they believed that Germany needed something that could be used to get news from Germany around the world, particularly to German colonies, um, without having physical cables that could be cut. 
So rather than World War I being a break, as we often think of it, a break in which propaganda becomes important, from the German perspective, it's more of an accelerant and a confirmation of things that many German elites had believed beforehand, namely that communications infrastructure was a part of warfare and that it was vulnerable and Germany had to invest in this new technology of wireless um, in order to try and reach as many people as possible and keep communication with Germany's colonies. Um, but actually the Allies too recognize this is important. Lots of the first battles outside of Europe during World War I are actually to conquer German colonies and to particularly conquer islands where there are German wireless stations. At the same time, the thing that continues to happen even as these battles are going on is that Germany tries to invest in sending news to the United States in particular, which is still neutral, of course, until 1917. Um, and there are a couple of wireless towers on the east coast of the United States uh, set up by a German wireless company called Telefunken, which receives news from Berlin in English, disseminates it to US newspapers. Um, and one of the surprising things I found while researching for this book was that actually this news is disseminated quite widely throughout the US from 1915 until 1917. Um, one of the super cool things actually about having digitized newspapers is now you can do these big data studies and really prove it's not just a couple of articles. I found more than 10,000 that were reporting on various aspects of the war on the Eastern Front. What is the Vatican doing, et cetera, that's coming directly from Germany. It's just that hadn't really been seen before because you had to know this is a German news agency, it's being sent by wireless and so on. So it, I think, underscores again the utility of looking at the networks behind the newspapers to see where that the power of communications really lies. And one of the recent articles you've done uh, takes us up to the present by arguing that this is just uh, information warfare as usual. And you argued in a piece in Foreign Affairs last year that uh, we, we shouldn't regard it as surprising that, for example, the Russian government engages in information warfare with its own state-controlled agencies. Uh, it was going on uh, a century ago and before that too. Yeah, so I think that flips our perspective on the last five to six years if we come to understand this history to show that information warfare, information rivalry, in, information competition, whatever we want to call it, um, was a feature of the international system and not a bug. Um, many of the people who, who saw what was happening over the last few years as unprecedented uh, probably spent a lot of their time uh, in the sort of 1990s world of information. And from the historian's perspective, what we would say is that was really the time that was unusual and exceptional. The period that I describe as much more the norm in which states think in different ways about how you can control communications infrastructure and information delivery as part of state power. So the world that, that we live in today uh, is a world not dominated so much by news agencies, but, but by network platforms. And those platforms finance themselves in the case of Facebook and Google through advertising, incredibly lucrative business that they have come to dominate. And, and they also essentially make themselves conduits for content of all kinds generated uh, predominantly by amateurs, not by professional journalists. And yet that creates at least some problems that, that we've uh, seen before, particularly the problem of, of fake news and uh, hate speech, uh, uh, terms that have become very common uh, these days, but, but have a history, I think. Yes, um, alas, they do. So I like to joke that when I was writing this book, uh, the present kept catching up with history. And, and it did so in, in really particular ways, including that much of the terminology of the period that I was writing about, um, such as the Nazi term Lügenpresse or lying press, started to suddenly be a term used by the far right in the United States, something I couldn't possibly have anticipated. And um, we've also seen the ways in which communications platforms can be used to abuse, marginalize, harass in different ways that are deeply disturbing, including in some instances that that can lead to offline harms in some cases, uh, lynch mobs, et cetera, as we've seen in places like India. So I think what we see is that there is, there is power behind these platforms. Uh, there are problems inherent in this type of communication, but we also need to be careful in thinking about how that power is exercised and what is unprecedented versus uh, what we've actually seen before. So what kinds of regulation can we have that may solve certain problems, but also being aware of how regulation can be manipulated. So I've written in, in the book and then in subsequent pieces about the way in which people who are very much democratically minded in the Weimar Republic 
unintentionally created regulation of radio, for example, that meant that when the Nazis came to power, they already controlled that content. Um, so I think this history gives us a whole host of things to think about, um, including why certain terminology has arose again, um, how we need to think about the type of people who are using this platform, but also how careful we need to be in thinking about regulation and its long-term consequences. And, and I think you're alluding there, Heidi, to the the, the new German Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, which is a mouthful uh, in German, uh, that the new rules uh, introduced recently in Germany uh, to control uh, the appearance of, of hate speech online. Uh, you wrote a somewhat critical piece for the Atlantic about the NetzDG. Talk a little bit about that finally. Yeah, so uh, NetzDG is a law that was created in and promulgated in 2017 and went into action from 2018. And what that law does is it enforces 22 extant statutes of German speech law online, uh, saying that if uh, users of platform like say Facebook uh, complain under this law, Facebook needs to attend to that within 24 hours or will be fined uh, 50 million euros per post. And there are lots of understandable reasons given German history that, that Germany really wants to try and attack what they saw as a problem of non-responsiveness of American-based platforms to what was illegal speech within Germany. Um, but there are some ironies to this law and things that we should consider. I'll just name a, a couple. Uh, one is that some of these statutes um, actually basically haven't really been used since the 1870s, including things like blasphemy. So um, a lot of free speech organizations are concern that some of these statues could actually end up with um, a sphere that's uh, more censored than uh, the general media and newspapers that people might read because some of these statues really haven't been used. They've been on the books, but not really used. Another concern that some have is that the way in which this law is structured has effectively created some copy and paste opportunities for authoritarians. Um, Russia, for example, copy and pasted some parts of NetzDG. We've seen some aspects of it uh, getting implemented in some other authoritarian or authoritarian leaning countries. Um, and there are, I think, debates. Uh, some people say, well, democracies have kind of just got to do what they want to do. And others say we should create laws that cannot be copied and pasted by authoritarians. Um, and I'll end with one final irony, which is that actually when you look at what happens with this law, it's given more power to platforms rather than less, because it's the platforms that decide which things under NetzDG get deleted, and they run it through their own terms of service and delete it under their own terms of service. So let's say, for example, Neil, you don't like something that I've posted, you think that it contravenes German law, you're in Germany, you flag it under NetzDG, Facebook takes it down under its own terms of service. So if I want to appeal, I appeal to Facebook, I don't actually appeal to a German court. So this is what we would call um, privatized enforcement. So it's sort of weird irony that it's meant to assert German law, but it's actually given more power uh, to the large platforms. Heidi, it's a perfect illustration of the law of unintended consequences, maybe the only real law of history that there is. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I found both the, the, the articles really revealing and, and the kind of thing that people in the United States should be reading before they start making bold declarations about how they should be inter, uh, regulating uh, the internet. The book, News from Germany, I uh, I believe is up for yet another book prize uh, and you're off uh, to hear about that now. I wish you every luck with that. It certainly deserves all the prizes it can get. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much.